Greetings, this is Artie from Artifact Electronics. In this episode we'll be having a look at an oscilloscope. This is a LaCroix 9400 dual trace uh, 125 meg digital oscilloscope. It was one of the first digital oscilloscopes ever offered for sale. It was made in the early 80s and uh, it looks like it was made in Switzerland. Now, I found this one on eBay. It was advertised as non-functional. Not partially. I, I mean, uh, the seller made it pretty clear that this thing was completely dead. Uh, he was asking like $75, and uh, it was a bit steep for a completely dead early 80s oscilloscope. And on top of that, he wanted $50 to ship it. But uh, on a lark, I, I was kind of intrigued by this because uh, of the timeline when it was built. And I looked at some online pictures. Essentially, it's entirely constructed of through-hole technology. And uh, we can fix anything with through-hole technology, right? Well, we'll see what happens. Anyway, I, since I was a bit intrigued, I thought uh, it had a best offer on it. I sent out the best offer of... Uh, $35, I think. I kind of forgot about it, and the next morning I get a message that my offer had been accepted. So essentially, uh, I'd pony up another 50 bucks for shipping, but $85, and uh, the scope was mine. It arrived a few days later, it was well packaged, and uh, I took it out of the box, I unwrapped the uh, bubble wrap, and I noticed there was a uh, reddish colored sand pretty much everywhere I took this thing, which seemed to be coming uh, from inside of the scope. Now this came from the state of New Mexico, famous for being the birthplace of the Altair computer and Microsoft, and it's a pretty dry climate over there. But obviously this had been stored in some shed or maybe out in the open, uh, where there was a lot of wind and a lot of sand, and uh, I guess the sand uh, migrated into it. So uh, I spent a lot of time just vacuuming the outside and getting rid of all the sand that came out of the box and uh, decided it was time to open it up, have a quick look on the inside and uh, see uh, what we could do about it. Now I should add that I bought this before I actually started the Artifact Electronics channel so I don't have any live or semi-live uh, footage, unfortunately, because I didn't film anything in the uh, at those times, because I didn't know this was going to go online. But uh, what I'll do is I'll... Uh, I remember very well what I've done to this. I've had uh, several sessions... I spent several sessions on a repair here. And uh, I'll just walk you through quickly what I found how I repaired it, and uh, and we'll show you the progress that it went through. So I removed both the top and bottom covers, each held on with four screws, and they slid off pretty easily, and we're looking at the uh, top of the scope. And uh, what we can see here is it has uh, four caged power supplies, so I'm built in a modular fashion that supply plus minus 15 and plus minus 5 and uh, then we have a card cage over here that has two acquisition boards one for each channel it has the board uh, this handles the GPIB I believe and this board is the front panel driver deep down inside we can see the motherboard which essentially covers almost the entire bottom of the instrument this is the video board mounted over here, and this is a monochrome 9-inch display that, uh, because the uh, scope is digital, is a raster-type display. Then we can have a look at the underneath, which shows you the motherboard, or the underneath of the motherboard, neatly laid out and labeled. 
if you look at the layout, this was most likely done with one of the early uh, computer-driven uh, layout programs because uh, these lines are just too neat to be and uh, too narrow to have been done by hand, is my guess. But uh, on to the uh, adventures. I mean, I, once I opened it, there was some sand in there, not a whole lot, but there was a bunch of there was reddish sand in there. And uh, I kind of figured, well, it's sand, so uh, there's probably some silicone in there, and silicone is a semiconductor, so that probably doesn't do the circuit boards a whole lot of good. So I vacuumed it out pretty diligently and got rid of most of the sand. I mean, you can still see some of the nooks and crannies, but it, it was pretty much all gone. So at this point, I was satisfied that... Uh, I had done my preliminary checks, nothing looked or smelled burnt, and uh, at the time I didn't have the uh, auto transformer that I have now, so I just plugged it into the wall and said, okay, let's turn on power to it. So I plugged it in and uh, proceeded to turn on power to it, and nothing happened. But not, nothing happened in the normal sense that you flip a switch and uh, you don't hear anything. The uh, power switch on this over here, right here, it wouldn't move. It was basically off, and no matter how hard I pushed it and tried to toggle it to on, it would not move. It was frozen solid. So uh, I went ahead removed the front panel here, took out the power switch, and what I did was I dunked it in isopropyl overnight, and the next morning I was able to move the switch with great difficulty, but I uh, repeated the isopropyl submersal uh, treatment on it, and after a few times I was able to flip the switch. So it clicked on and off, and uh, I measured it, it had continuity, and one other thing you may notice, there are black burn marks over here. The scope didn't come like that. That is entirely my fault because uh, when I put the switch, I didn't want to remount it because that was a long procedure. So I just kind of put it in here and thought I had it isolated. And the minute I plugged it into the wall, it started sparking. So yeah, this is my fault. I didn't get it like that. But at that time, it didn't seem to hurt anything. So I put it in. Pa uh, plugged it into the wall and turned it on. And uh, not a whole lot happened. The fan wouldn't run, the screen didn't light up, and uh, I couldn't even hear the horizontal frequency on, on the CRT, so that wasn't working. But I did notice one thing. What I did notice was that there's annunciator lights uh, next to some of these buttons. And I noticed some of them came on. Now the fan wasn't running, and uh, so I tried to change uh, settings on it. And it has, a, it has a lot of buttons on the bottom here, and uh, going up the left side of it. But basically the buttons... I thought I'd press the button see if I could change the lights, but it turned out that all of the buttons suffered from the same malady as the power switch. They were frozen. I could not push them in. So I went through the rather lengthy procedure of, uh, I mean, the front panel was still off, going and essentially squirting isopropyl inside the switches uh, using something like this, where that nozzle basically let me get into the switches, and while sp uh, spraying it with the isopropyl, vigorously working them up and down, and eventually I got them all to move, and at that point I noticed that I could actually affect operation of the scope. For instance, the coupling here, it has lights under what your coupling is, and uh, so if you looked at that over here at the coupling, as I was pushing the up and down buttons, the light was moving up and down. So something in there was working, but the uh, but the fan not working, and of course the monitor not working, I was a little bit more worried about the fan because I know these are kind of like uh, Xbox 360s. Uh, they really, they're serious about the fan. If the fan doesn't run, 
it will probably self-destruct pretty quickly. So now it was time to go and look at the fan. So what was wrong with the fan? I took out a bunch of the boards here. For completeness, after pulling them out, I remembered. Uh, and in the order from outside to inside, it had the trigger board, channel 2, channel 1, and then the uh, front panel processor board that came out. And there's the fan, and uh, I went and tried to turn it by hand, and this was getting really old. The fan was stuck. It wasn't moving. I checked if it was getting voltage, the connectors down here, and it was getting voltage, but the fan wasn't turning. But one thing I noticed was there was something like, it looked like pieces of straw sticking out of the hub. So I, I took a pair of tweezers and started to pull all the straw, and it, it really was straw. Made a little pile of it, and every time I turned the fan, more pieces you started to appear at the joint between the hub and uh, the main part here, and uh, I just kept pulling them out. And I noticed that all of a sudden the fan started to turn when I turned it by hand, not very freely, but at least it wasn't completely stuck. So I powered it up again, and it was rotating at like 5 RPM or something like that. But when I turned it off, just the fact of letting it rotate seemed to push the straw from the inside of the fan out the hub again. So I rinsed and repeated and uh, did that a couple of times. And uh, finally, finally, it looked like the fan was coming up to speed. So I put, I put the boards back in, I turned it on, the fan was running, there was air coming out of the back, still no CRT, but as I said before, the lights on the front, I could affect them by pressing buttons. So something was working in there. Uh, I couldn't really test much more. I mean, hooking up a signal to it at that point would not would not have been very useful because there was really... I guess I could have observed if the uh, trigger light went on or not, but uh, I needed... I definitely needed to get the CRT back into operation, so that was the next major thing to look at. But prior to going on to the uh, CRT, I did the uh, obvious thing to do, and that is uh, I checked all four power supplies here. They were all very close to their stated voltage and the ripple was extremely low and uh, so the power supply at least coming out of here coming out of the uh, caged power supplies over here was good now there are additional voltage regulators on some of the boards and uh, that also needs to be checked but uh, next uh, I'm going to attempt or I did attempt to pull the video board and see if there was anything on the video board I could find. Because the board over here, which we'll pull in a minute, also generates the uh, high voltages for the CRT. So let's have a look at that. It took me a while to get the video board out because, of course, there was a screw that was obscured by the uh, side handles. So I was trying to yank out that board and it just wouldn't want to come out. But the Finally, I found the screw and everything came out. The CRT, even though I did discharge it, uh, there was no cracks or pops or anything like that because uh, obviously the CRT didn't work, so there was no stored charge. So all I had to do is take the high voltage cover off, which I removed some screws from, getting ready for a lengthy debugging session. But uh, the gods smiled upon me and pretty much the second or third thing I checked yeah, let's get that into light the cathode rectifying diode over here was open as simple as that and uh, showing you the back there's also a bottom cover that the top cover holds in place but Turns out that that was really all that I could find. And to me it seemed like a pretty good chance that I had found the uh, problem with the CRT at that point. So after replacing the diode, I had to put everything back together again and go in for another test. But before going on, I think I found something interesting here. 
it looks like I missed a spot when I cleaned up the sand and uh, you can see it am I obscuring that? yes I am I've put my hand up but those brown areas you can see back there that is some of the sand that is still in there. I guess some of the lower uh, layers of the sand had a little bit of moisture and they actually stick on pretty well. I mean I cleaned up the motherboard but I guess I missed that spot but that's basically what everything looked like inside with a couple of extra layers of loose sand on top of them. Alright that was a lot of fun getting the video board back in. You kind of need three hands for it. Uh, to get all the wires and connectors in and it's somewhat interlocking that the neck board connects down here but when the board is slid in all the way uh, when the video board is slid down all the way you can't reach that connector to plug the neck board back in so everything is a balancing act at that point and holding everything just right and then sliding it down and then it catches on a bunch of uh, uh, spacers and it's a very interesting procedure but it looks like it went back in again and uh, I wish I could show you the motherboard in its entirety but uh, I am not going to because uh, I have to remove all the power supplies and that's another balancing act because you got to hold them slightly in the air while sliding out the connectors to the motherboard and blah 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 so I've done that once already when I when I actually cleaned the board with alcohol. I pulled the ROMs and uh, checked them. You can see some of them uh, poking through here. I mean, I didn't have a reference, but I just made sure that they read and uh, checked some uh, several times in a row. Relabeled them for future reference. And the interesting thing is this thing has the FFT option in there, which the ROMs, I guess, they're version 2.06 FT and uh, that means they have the FFT option on there. Right underneath all of these power cages is the main processor which is a Motorola 68000 so uh, if it was good enough uh, for the Mac, well I guess this thing came a lot earlier but uh, the 68000 is functioning as a signal processor in here and of course it has another processor. Uh, I'll have to look at the board to see if I can identify it but the board that reads the front panel is an NEC 7210C which uh, you can see there and this one has a date code of 84 on it but that's basically what reads the front panel and uh, informs the main processor of uh, what's going on alright then the uh, big moment had arrived Everything was uh, put back in, left the uh, covers off, and let's see what it does. Fan spins up. Some of the annunciator lights come on. I hear relays clicking, and boom! We got an orange display. So you can adjust the intensity for both the uh, traces and the grid. The uh, CRT looks like it's in perfect shape. The trigger light's blinking, so it's it's auto triggering. So let's uh, put in a signal. Let's see what that has to say. So let's go into channel A and have a look at the. So that's just me touching the uh, tip of the probe, inducing a bunch of noise into channel 1 and uh, putting it into the uh, calibration output. For a brief second there we saw a good 
somewhat good square wave. And uh, let's say if we can set the, uh, the trigger level here. Uh, it's not stable. The trigger, it isn't uh, triggering stably, but uh, so the mode is on auto. And basically that's what the first channel looks like and then it just goes bananas and then it fixes itself again so channel one kinda works but just kind of and uh, let's see if we turn off channel two it doesn't make any difference we're still back Oh, that's a good one. Okay, back in auto. Let's see if it'll... See, now it looks like it's being stable. And then it goes cockeye again. So basically that's what the uh, first channel looks like, and uh, if then we go to the uh, second channel, we turn off channel 1, and we turn on channel 2. And we see a somewhat good signal, a bit of overshoot on the rising edge, and uh, And it's showing very similar behavior. Let's trigger it off channel 2, and that will stabilize it. Put a little bit of the overshoot, but other than that, there you go. But uh, keep in mind this is a calibration signal. It's a, uh, I think it's a 1 kilohertz square wave. But things, uh, things kind of really go to shit when we try a little bit uh, higher higher frequency waveforms and uh, look at the different kind of waveform here. Now you can see it's being it's not responding it's not responding to the position control or oh, that's the display control we can move the trace up and down it's really laggy by the way and look now the second channel does the same thing and then it fixes itself again and same thing well with the first channel so let's put in a real signal here and see what that shows us now remember I said it was kinda laggy I mean with no signals going in you can see me turn the position and it's not exactly I mean it is it is lagging and even adjusting the zero reference here and that's on both of them so so I think that's probably inherent in the design that the uh, 68k just the update rate is not fast enough to give you immediate response on your input but uh, I've hooked up a uh, test signal and uh, let's go to up the frequency a bit let's go to 50k hertz so we got a 50k hertz triangle and uh, got a really slow update rate here so hello oh 
Okay, so there's our 50 kHz signal. It's not uh, triggering very reliably on it, no matter how much I adjust the uh, level. Oh, I got it right in the middle. It is stable now. And I'm turning the delay control here. But as you can see, something is interfering pretty badly with the display. And now if we have a look at channel 2. So there's channel 2, but it's got a bunch of dots on the trace. Let's go to triggering off channel 2. <clears throat> And it goes really bad. So after warming up a bit, it's not doing that noise dance anymore. But you can see these, don't know if you can see that very clearly, but these little sparkling dots here showing up on trace number two. So once it got to this position, it looked like trace number one was uh, working just fine. Well, it did it is displaying a little bit of those dots sparkly dots up here too but not as much as on this one so let's make it the uh, same height and uh, it's you can see some distortion in the waveform on the second channel whereas the first channel looks pretty smooth now, the funny thing is, is that the problem kind of changed since the last time I looked at it, because the situation I was in was that uh, channel 1 was working perfectly, but channel 2 was displaying that interspersed noise, the peaks happening all over the place. and So, uh, at that point, it looked like uh, one of the acquisition cards was bad, and... Uh, so let's just assume we're back there in acquisition and uh, trace 1 is good and trace 2 isn't good. So I did some standard troubleshooting because at that point I figured that one of the, uh, that this acquisition card for channel 2 had a problem. I swapped the cards physically and the problem wandered from channel 2 to channel 1. So it was definitely on that acquisition board. I proceeded to put uh, replace all of the electrolytic caps. Actually, I did that on both boards, and uh, nothing changed. Now each board has uh, two analog to digital converter chips and one uh, DAC. And what I did was I swapped those three chips, which were conveniently uh, socketed, from one board to the next, and nothing changed. Which means that those three chips, which I'm pretty sure are non-obtainium, did work correctly. So I dove into the schematics and, I mean, this is basically a digitizing scope. It takes an analog signal, converts it to digital, but uh, each one of the uh, acquisition cards have an array of static RAM on there that it DMAs the, uh, the, the digital data, the sample digital data into, and then the main processor comes, queries it for the data, and displays it on the screen. So if we have a quick look at the, uh, at the acquisition cards, I can tell you uh, what I am suspecting. Here's what the acquisition boards look like. It uh, gets the analog signal in from the front end, it has uh, two analog to digital converters and a DAC. Both the DAC and one of the ADCs are LaCroix marked, so they, uh, they're probably custom parts or custom made for them. There's a bunch of voltage regulators on here, which I, uh, which I tested, which was kind of difficult because if you have an extension card, it becomes easy, but uh, uh, I couldn't find one. So I basically had to clip on small leads to the outputs of the regulators, put everything back together, power it up, and then uh, measure the voltages. 
both DC and uh, AC. Voltages all turned out to be okay. So uh, the next thing I suspected was let's see if any of uh, these guys have gone bad and they're all socketed actually. So what I did was I uh, yeah I swapped those as I mentioned before and it made no difference which uh, I mean when the trace was good the trace was good. So these guys seem to be working okay. Now, what my suspicion with this was, with the original problem, where channel 1 was good and channel 2 was bad, uh, was something... I mean, uh, you see a bunch of static RAM here that uh, it DMAs the digital... the acquired signal in, di in a digital form into this RAM, and uh, it then... It, it's interleaved, and then it gets DMA'd I'm not sure if it gets DM8 or if the main processor reads it one by one, but then the data goes out. So my suspicion was that since uh, the digital side, the processor side, I mean, they're essentially dual porting this RAM, that somehow, because it's sitting on the same digital data bus for the main processor, that one of these guys, either one of the RAM chips was bad, but more likely one of the driver chips was bad and messing up the bus, and that was making one of the signals go bad and showing those weird peaks. But since we just looked at it, it now looks like both of the boards display almost the exact same problem with the uh, uh, with the overload peaks in there. But they're identical if you look at both of the uh, 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 both of the traces. So what I'm thinking is uh, the problem is. In either in one or more bad RAMs in here, but more likely in the driving circuitry. So when the process is trying to read a specific digital value and it's turning on a specific RAM, because some of the drivers either on this board or on the other board are bad, it's inadvertently uh, creating bus contention with several data sources. And that's why we see the uh, signal basically peaking either peaking uh, way on top or dropping all the way down. And uh, testing this again uh, is going to be rather difficult to say the least. Now I had a look at the service manual and uh, aside from uh, uh, LaCroix having made available an extender card for this so you could actually if I had that, I could put it out and put a scope on the uh, data lines going to the main processor and basically see data contention can usually be seen uh, without very deep analysis. You just do a comparison of what the data lines look like. And if one is completely out of whack, then there's a pretty good chance that there's two of these guys trying to drive the line at the same time. But uh, I couldn't uh, get one of the extender cards. And reading further on is uh, using an external HP Unix uh, uh, computer, uh, you can get some test software that will actually go and do test these RAMs bit by bit and do all of the internal tests, uh, if it's able to do so, of course, and be able to identify what the problem is. But again, I don't think I have a... Uh, have much of a chance getting hold of that software. I mean, I'd probably find the HP computer that they recommend, but finding the software uh, is probably not going to happen. So uh, at that point, uh, I came to the conclusion that I probably put enough effort into this, and uh, I pretty much reached a point where I think I gave it a I gave it a good shot, but I think there's going to be other things out there uh, that my time is going to be better uh, utilized uh, looking at some different equipment than continuing to look at this one. Now that may seem flippant to you, but keep in mind I've had this for a long time. I've spent several sessions trying to debug it, and I spent an ungodly amount of time on this already. So, uh, I think at this point I'm giving up. So here we are. There are a bunch more things that I checked. I, I couldn't put them in the video because this video would become really, really long. 
But uh, I did some signal tracing. I checked the stuff going into the front end and coming out of the front end. The uh, inputs to the primary ADCs on, the on each acquisition card, all of that looked good. I checked the differential signal going to the trigger card, that also looked good. So, yes, I am still thinking that we have a problem of uh, bus contention on, on, the, on one of the digital buses in here. Because uh, there's quite a few clients that try to use that bus. Ah, oh, look at that. Had a perfect signal there for a while. So obviously the uh, problem is intermittent. I've also used cold spray uh, while the cards were in there. Well, I just used regular compressed air, turned it upside down. And uh, since I didn't have a whole lot to, to lose, basically sprayed the shit out of the boards and it didn't make any difference. So it's not a temperature related thing, but uh, if you can come up with something really good uh, to suggest for me to try, and it's got to be real good for me to consider it, but uh, leave me a comment and uh, maybe I'll pull out this guy again and see if it works because uh, when the trace looks nice, it looks nice. I mean, I, I, wish it would, I wish this was in functioning condition. But anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something. And uh, make sure you subscribe. Look at that. And uh, if you want to see more of these guys, then make sure to leave me a thumbs up. It had to do it, didn't it? So what happens now if I change waveforms on the function generator? Yeah, it's a shame. I wish I could get this to work, but I can't. So. Uh, See you later.